we're never going to get this. We're gonna try. You'd think we'd rehearse or something, yeah. but yeah, yeah well, this is, this is, you get what you pay for, so... <laughs> Oh my gosh. Uh, my name is Ginger Lumen, uh, and this is uh, our uh, Facebook Live chat for our, what do we call this thing? Um, Life Practice, Life practice PBL. PL. Thanks. Yeah. Absolutely. It's getting there. It's, 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 it's been a day like that, I'm just going to say. Half ahead. Okay. Oh, 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 well, I'm going to turn to you because you're but... the one people want to see anyway. Okay. Okay, right. Anyway, so uh, I just want to say thanks for coming in. I know that we've got folks who are going to come in later. Scott, you're with us. Yay. Um, if you're watching this later, just fast forward for the first 30 seconds or so. Uh, anyway, so my name's Ginger Lumen. I uh, work for a nonprofit service center here in uh, Hutchinson, Kansas, but I get the honor and privilege to travel across the United States. And I really get the honor and privilege to work in the same pod with this chick right here. This is, <laughs> this is Katie Perez. And uh, I'm going to make a joke about the thermometer, ther thermostat here in a little bit, but I, I was going to. Whatever, I'll try not to. Anyway, uh, Katie Perez is a consultant at ESDAC as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, you work with uh, STEM and science and STEAM and elementary level. And what else do you do? Uh, digital citizenship and PDL oh. and a little bit of literacy here and there. I am a generalist. I got it all. You yeah, know, yeah. Elementary teachers, we have to, you know, do it all, right? That, that's so. the thing, right? Okay, so. Um, Master of all trades. Yes, yes, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> so, listen, uh, again, trying to keep this to where we can still have a, have a life afterward, uh, to where this isn't such a long thing. Uh, but our, our topic today is PBL in the elementary classroom and with primary and, and up to fifth grade, right? Right. Okay. And there, I, I go out and work with folks. Listen, I, I have answers for elementary teachers, but sometimes they'll ask me questions that... I haven't worked there. I haven't taught below four, uh, below fifth grade. And so some of the things they'll ask, I'll say, well, we should be able, but I'm not talking from a position of hard authority. And anytime we have to do PBL work with here at ESDAC, I'm always like, you want this girl uh, for elementary. And she does a great job. So I said, I want your brain uh, on this live Facebook Live because you get a lot of the same questions yes. that I get, but you're able to answer them. <laughs> Hopefully. So I'm gonna, I give an answer for sure. <laughs> I, I like your answer. Good. They make sense and, and they don't disagree with what I believe. So, <laughs> and, and that we know from research too. Yes. Yes. So uh, she's here to help us with some of those questions again that uh, the elementary teachers are wrestling with as they're trying to move into that more PBL based classroom instruction. So Katie, let's get into this. Awesome. One of the reasons or one of the questions that we get is how teachers balance the need to teach literacy and math with the desire to teach PBL because they don't see those two working together. Right. Right. Um, so that there's, I think there's kind of three different ways you can do this. Um, obviously, you know, our goal, K2, is to really teach students how to, how to read, uh -huh. um, how to do math. Uh, and I'm not, I'm not in the camp that you can do that through PBL. Uh, I think that there are people who are out there, and they, they, we, we, could, we could argue with each other. Um, we wrestle. We don't argue. Oh, no, we we have wrestle. discussions. Right. Wrestle sounds worse. <laughs> um, <laughs> Which, by the way, you and I don't disagree on this either. No, no, no. You and it's, I. It's We're, some of the yeah. gurus so, that say. It's not our ESDAC office here. It it's is. all magic. Uh, okay. With teaching literacy, we know that in order for students to learn how to read, they have to have direct, explicit, and systematic instruction. It just That's the way that it is. Uh, those phonics skills are not going to be learned through exploration or discovery um, of just giving them more books and putting a book in their hands and magic, oh, I can read. Um, we'll discover how to read. Yeah, no, it doesn't. <laughs> we know. Um, so I, I, there are schools out there who will try to, or people who will try to teach PBL all day, every day, and I don't think they get the results that are, that are as effective if you try to find a balance in between. So I promote that teachers should pick a social studies and science focus. And within social studies and science, we always say it, right? We always say that this is where they apply the math and reading skills, the math and language skills. So you pick those as a, that, that's the bank of time that you're using. And you're still teaching your phonics, you're still teaching your math, you're still teaching those literacy skills explicitly throughout your day. And then they capitalize on that practice time in social studies and science. And kids are learning that social studies and science rich, deep content 
through the PDL exploration. Um, there, are, there are others who will completely separate out totally those literacy and math skills from their PBL, and they're really just teaching social studies and science through PBL. I'd argue that those ELA and math skills are being taught there as well. I like to launch a project. So uh, working with a teacher um, right now who's planning a fairy tale project that she's going to do with students, and it's basically character traits. So she was asking, when am I going to teach these character traits? Do I, do I teach them explicitly beforehand, or do I teach them within the project? I think you launch the project, and then you have a discussion with students where you say, oh, we are, we're going to need to know these character trait skills. Let's learn that. And we, we capitalize on that chance to teach the instruction, mm -hmm. or chance to have the instruction when it matters, that just-in-time learning. Mm -hmm hits at the right spot, because how many times have you taught character traits to your kids, and then they still give you uh, brown hair, blue eyes, tall, short, when I'm looking for kind or courageous or whatever, those looking for personality traits and character traits, not physical traits. Right. So it, it, it provides that shift for kids. I like that. I like that a lot, because... Sometimes we're told that, no, we have to pre-teach these skills. And, and, and I don't believe that we do in the secondary level. And you're telling me that there are times when we do need to and there are times when we don't. And so we want to look for opportunities to not pre-teach mm -hmm. and recognize that it's okay if somebody says, you've got to be a PBL classroom, um, that in the elementary level specifically, there are sometimes you just have to do direct instruction. Right, and I think that direct instruction can happen within your PBL. So there are times where we don't have something going on. We don't all know something. Right. Uh, and you might have a spot where you have one group who needs a piece of information, and everybody else already has it. So yeah, you're going to just really instruct in that one little group. If you see that happening in two groups, I normally stop and say, hey, you know, group over here had a great point. We just realized we need to know this. Let's all take some time. Let's step away from what we're doing right now. Let's focus on this for a few minutes. And you provide that direct moment for them and then you let them go back into their groups and work. Uh, so it's a, it's a, it's a two-step. You're, you're balancing, you're going back and forth all of the time between the two, which is fun. I mean, I think that that provides that relevant piece for students to, to want to learn. It's the just-in-time learning that we know is important. It's the being flexible for their needs and their individual needs uh, is, is what we know is important. And by the way, that's the exact same thing I say for a secondary, mm -hmm. exact same thing. So we're good. So um, you've talked about some direct instruction, and, but we've got standards at the elementary level too. And not only do we have standards, we have a ton of standards because one teacher is teaching all subjects. Uh, and so at least all the core subjects. Um, and, and sometimes there are times where we've got two writing periods or two reading periods a day, am I right? right. Some schools do two math periods. And there are standards that we want to make sure that we're touching, that we're addressing, because we want to make sure the kids have a strong foundation. Uh, how can they do that inside PBL? I mean, how much time? So I think that the time issue, I mean, that's a huge conversation that we might just have to conveniently have scheduled for another talk coming up soon. <laughs> um, <laughs> but again, I think you're, you're trying to find a balance in there where it, we know that within the curriculums that we have, the standards that we're given, we can choose to either do that gloss over and cover everything throughout the year, or we can really dig in and we can teach things. And so we have to kind of prioritize which standards deserve a PBL, because uh, not everything does. There are some things within my standards that it needs to just be, this is, this is it. We use quotation marks. I mean, I'm not going to do a huge PBL focus on how to use quotation marks. I'm going to embed that in somewhere, and it becomes a mini lesson. Um, Ask the kids to create some sort of dialogue somewhere and say, yes. how do I know that they're speaking? Or quotation marks? Do we know anything about this? You don't need to spend a week on it, right? right. It doesn't be some huge formal thing. Right. Um, so a lot of times when we start to look at those standards, we can kind of prioritize when and where they need to be um, truly developed. Then at the same time, um, we want to capitalize on those big moments so if you lay out a project, one of my favorite things to do with teachers is give them a project launch um, in a workshop, give them a project launch, get them interested, get them hooked, get them through that first kind of start of this, the planning stage, mm -hmm. and then stop them and say, okay, so what content did you see? And typically I can have a list of nine or ten different science things that we could say, oh, this is about waves, or no, it's not about force and motion, or this is about um, communication information, and we can take all those standards in science. And then you say, okay, so what else? And oh, in social studies, we have this and this. We have civilization. We have um, colonization. We have, we have uh, 
part of um, communication and inventions over time, or whatever it is, ELA, what do we have going on? And then I like to pick one from each area. Sure. So um, just worked on, we were talking about Mars Colony the other day, worked on that with teachers. And for fourth grade, I would capitalize on the waves, communication waves, how are we going to communicate with Earth, how are we going to, satellites, how does all that stuff work? Yeah. Social studies, what's the government system going to be like when we get up there? If we're building a Mars Colony, we got to have some laws. And then ELA, well, we're making a proposal. So what, what kind of ELA skills do we need in here for proposal? And then in math, I'm, I'm scaling, I'm figuring out some percentages for different reasons of mm -hmm. oxygen and, and gravity, things like that. And that's what I'm teaching. Those are the ones I'm really capitalizing on. Everything else is incidentally taught. Right. And then I might do another project that's going to hit something else mm -hmm. in a different way. So it's it everything comes back to deep content standards. I, I'm tying it back every single time. That driving question has deep content embedded in with it. But it's not about covering the standard throughout the year. And I really like, I'm going to steal this back for just a second, I really like the thought that some of these, uh, your content focus, but there may be some other ones that they show up and you touch on them as either a, hey, remember mm -hmm. the other project we did we, that's in here? Or or they don't even know we, unless we draw attention to it. They're just practicing right. it. Um, we call that what? Trojan horse learning? It's in before they even know it's there. Uh, we can also use this sort of thing to touch on things that we're getting ready to teach a little later on down the road so that they can have some... Uh, I don't know, previous knowledge developed before we get to that one. Right. Well, with that as well, I think we talked last time a little bit, um, last time we did a, a Facebook Live together, we talked about math and how a lot of times math gets thrown into this type of thing and it's, yeah. um, it's, it's not as intentional as it should be. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think a big thing with that at the K-5 level is that a lot of the math that we need to do in a PBL or any kind of STEAM or maker thing, it's not quite, there's no standard for it in K-5 math. It's it's beyond that basic math that we're teaching at K-5. So I'm not labeling it. It's there. I'm not labeling it. It becomes something that happens in 7th or 8th grade, and kids go, oh, thank you. this is like totally when we scaled that That's right. big, huge box that we built and mm -hmm. whatever. It, it, we don't have to label every piece of learning that they do. And, and they may remember it, but they for sure will remember it in a collaborative school where somebody says, hey, by the way, I did this with these kids. Make sure you... If you want to, you know, and they, and they would, they'd, they'd invoke that previous knowledge. I've even had kids before uh, fifth, sixth grade who were working on a social studies project where they ended up needing trigonometry. And, uh, and so, well, I'm not much of a trig teacher. Uh, and, and I reached out to my network and said, hey, I need somebody. And, and, and had a lady from the University of Chicago come in and Skype with my kids and worked with them through it. And the kids just talked back to her, not talk back. But I mean, <laughs> like, responded and, and grew. And when they went home, I made sure that they knew what to share when they got home. What did you guys learn at school today? <gasps> oh, my gosh, we got to do trig today. And so now my fifth and sixth graders are starting to feel more confident with math because, mm -hmm. well, it can't be that hard. And, and they're not, it's not like they're in a trig course, but it is trigonometry. And we don't have to wait until a certain age right. to start letting kids play with these things. And it's, it's pretty amazing what they can do. I, I, I have a, a little story I tell about a math project that I gave my students. Uh, I was going to be out for about two weeks' time um, solid, and I left just this math project that my kids were going to do, and I expected it to take that two weeks. Uh, what I didn't mean to do was leave the entire thing that went into middle school and high school math, and I came back to um, staircases built all around my classroom out of snap cubes because they had gone and gathered snap uh, connecting cubes from every classroom they could find in the building so they could complete this 12th grade math problem um, that I didn't and expect for them to do and then they, they could they could explain it were their formulas correct absolutely not but they understood the process of what they were doing and it was it was that whole PBL I have to learn I'm going to go research I'm going to um, connect with other people who can't understand and uh, they did it. They, they were really able to apply mathematics without any true grasp of what they're doing at it's the a time. Mathematical thinking yes. they were practicing. And you left that for a sub. So, I did. You're a horrible a person. <laughs> she loved it. <laughs> Stephanie, good. you're amazing if you're watching. <laughs> That's awesome. Okay, I want to pause here just for a second. We have one more question for sure we're going to dive into. Uh, but I want to be sure. Oh, uh, Tanya, uh, I'm going to pull this closer because we're old and blind. Uh, she says, we are departmentalized. 
and I teach math. I know there are math ideas on your cards, Ginger, but where might I find ideas and PBLs for math? Okay. Um, I can drop that link in in, in a moment, but uh, the Buck Institute has great stuff. The Intel uh, unit plan indexes, Tanya, I'm not sure what grade level you're talking about there, uh, but they have a great um, categorized by content and grade, and they have stuff just beautifully written out, like a, like a, like a perfect lesson plan uh, for project-based learning, where your kids truly are doing PBL. They've got that ch challenge or the question they're answering, uh, and they're learning by answering those questions or challenges. Um, so I'll drop a link in there, and so this is where I was going, Tanya. You're like, perfect. I, again, pay you $5 for taking me where I was getting ready to go. Thanks. If you have questions right now, or if you're viewing later because you didn't realize, oh, it's 4.30 and I'm still doing track or whatever. You, what is track is at this time of year? Football? Volleyball? Whatever. So that you've got some sort of activity after school. And uh, so you're watching this later tonight or tomorrow or two weeks from now. Uh, drop in a question in here. And uh, and we get notified. We no, I guess I get notified. You don't get notified. I'm just on a these. creeper. I look. <laughs> <laughs> well, feel free to jump in any time and uh, drop a question in uh, about particularly teaching PBL in our primary in our K five uh, areas. And I know K five isn't necessarily primary, but we're playing here, right? right. Elementary. Yeah, elementary. And. Uh, and, and we'll, we'll make sure that we get good answers for you. Don't think that if you join us not live that you can't ask questions or respond in here. Uh, if you do have a question, just like Tavi did, jump right in here because we've got one more question to wrestle with, and it'll give you time to drop yours in before I wrap it up super fast. So are we ready? We're ready. All right. Here we go. This is, I'm going to push this back again. I just feel like we're, like, too close sometimes. It's creepy looking up our noses. All right, my nose. So the question is, PBL often asks kids to build things, right? Construction, something. It's constructivist thinking, right? And often we see PBL where kids are constructing with actual tools, like glue guns and stuff. And elementary teachers all seem to have a little mini stroke when we mention that sort of thing. Sometimes for good reason. I've seen adults, uh, secondary teachers, like freak out when I talk box cutters and things like that. But... As someone who's taught specifically at that elementary level for years, um, and you didn't have anybody, let me double check this, you didn't have anybody lose any fingers, and nobody lost an arm or a leg or a foot or anything, right? And nobody died. Yeah, right. Okay, good. Okay. So what advice do you have for those real teachers teaching real kids right. and using tools? All right, start okay. talking. So, so box. So I, I'm going to sit tall for this. Awesome. Um, <laughs> We ha they have to. They have to use these tools. Okay? I mean, just get over it. Oh. And, and here's why. I know. I know. That's hard to say. Okay, it is. Okay. Um, but you, at one point in life, you had a little toy, mm -hmm. and it had, it was a, a board, two boards like this, and one in the middle, and it had six pegs inside, uh -huh. and it came with a mallet, and uh -huh. you did what? You pound it through. Right? Mm -hmm. And then you flipped it over. No bells and whistles, didn't give you any feedback, and say, good job, and stars and stickers. The whole point of that toy was to teach you hand-eye coordination mm -hmm. and how to use a hammer, okay? So give a kid a hammer this day, and do you know where they pick it up? Maybe the, by, it? The, by the, the, the Yeah, by, by the, the head. head. And yeah. so then they're going to try to go put that little tiny nail in the wall, and they're going to end up with sore fingers and a hole in the wall, okay? So nobody's teaching kids how to use these tools. And we don't like it, but we're nutritionists. We're, diet, we're social workers. When we say this all the time, right? We have all these jobs. Okay, so add on to your, your task list that we're teaching skilled labor jobs. Um, and we say, I okay, told you, still soapbox soap. Uh, we say that we're preparing kids for college and career, right? Uh -huh. Okay. When we say career, I'm going to say that we mean white collar, right? I mean, we're, we're not really talking about I'm preparing somebody to be a plumber. I'm preparing somebody to be um, the man who picks up my trash can, right? I, that's a real thing. We have to teach those skilled labor jobs, too. Okay, we're, I know you're on a soapbox. Can I interrupt you, you for a can. second? You can. Okay. Really? In fourth grade, we're going to teach them okay. how to do skilled labor? No, we're not. But here's the problem. If we don't start, when, when do we start? If we don't start in K-5, then when do we ever start? Um, we're in our sixth consecutive year. I just looked this statistic up. Sixth consecutive year of not being able to fill skilled labor jobs in America. And 17% of employers say the number one reason we can't. There's 34% who say it's because of uh, just it, lack of experience and the technical abilities. You're not learning that in K-5. But 17% say it's the soft skills. They, okay. do, they can't 
they can't fill those skilled labor jobs because of this, those basic skills of being able to use the tools, communicate, collaborate. When do we teach those? That's the entire, for me, my classroom, I want to leave fifth grade. My fifth graders need to leave knowing how to communicate, collaborate, and use some basic tools. That's the entire point of elementary education, in my opinion. Okay. The content is important, but not as much as producing them, uh, producing people who can communicate, collaborate with others, talk, work together, solve a problem, and figure out how to find content on their own. I agree with you on all those points, and I would like to add one more. Okay. I think that our kids, if we don't teach them how to be smart with tools and safe with tools, then that's when they start grabbing tools and start ruining things, or worse, ruining parts of someone <laughs> themselves or someone else. Yeah, I have a nice little burn on my hand right here from someone not knowing how to use a hot glue gun. Right, and not one of your students. <laughs> no, no, no. It was a, an, an older, adult at, right. at the fair. <laughs> and it wouldn't let you use it because right. of safety issues, and then she burnt you. So here's how you deal with the safety issues. Oh. Um, uh, for hot glue guns. Okay, Move sorry. Yeah, yeah, I can't reach yeah. my arms are short. Um, <laughs> hot glue guns. My daughter is four, turning <laughs> five on Friday, and, and she uses a low-temperature hot glue gun on a regular basis. The safety feature I have embedded for her is that we went to... Home Depot or Lowe's, whatever your local little hardware store is, and we bought gardening gloves, those vinyl gardening gloves. Um, they're thin, not the real padded kind, because then you lose the dexterity of being able to actually do something. Which they already have um, lost, <laughs> or not developed <laughs> yet. Um, those gardening gloves, they, they drop the glue on it, it's going to peel right off, it's not going to be hot long enough to make it all the way through the skin. So just provide some safety gloves, just like we provide safety glasses. You're not going to do tool work without having something covering your eyes. Let them have something to cover their hands. I mean, it, it probably is the equivalent of giving a kid something to weld with, right? Yeah, I mean, sure, it's, a hot, sure. it's a hot tool. Um, so give them some gloves to use, and then show them how to use it, right? Maybe hand over hand at first. I mean, that's what I did with, with my daughter. I held her hand and showed her how to glue, and now she can do it on her own. Uh, if you're talking those, uh, you can buy the the make do saw those kinds of things. They mm -hmm. they're, they're great. Um, well, but I don't know. You, you ever also... try to cut a pumpkin with one of those pumpkin saws they give you? <laughs> exactly. Give me a knife every day. <laughs> uh, but just a regular hacksaw blade's not going to cut your hand off, right? That's I mean, right. I, I actually just demonstrated for a school district the other day that it doesn't. And look, there's there's nothing on the back of my hand anymore. Um, I had some little superficial. Uh, dry skin marks when I did it, but there wasn't any. <laughs> like that, like that <laughs> lotion commercial. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> there's no cut. There's no blood coming out. Uh, they can. They can use these tools. And it's more fun to build your project if you're the one building it instead of the teacher. Yeah. And I think they can't learn the safety unless they get the tools in their hand. Right. If we continue to put bubble wrap over everything, then when they eventually will get the tool in their hand, things are going to go wrong. We have to use them. I'm with you. We do the makerspace field trips here, and uh, usually I might have one kid who gets hurt, and it's usually by scissors, not anything more dangerous than scissors. I have seen so and many scissors. And it's because cuts. Of we're using scissors improperly. That's right. That's but right. Every time. The majority time. of the um, injuries that I have in makerspace times are, are teachers, to be honest. With you. Yep, me too. <laughs> me too. They're always the first ones to first get injured. Ones to every time. Oh my gosh. Okay, so we have a question that came in here from Scott, which is sort of related, sort of not. He says, Supplies are so hard to get. Yet. And he's talking about elementary classroom and just PBL in general. That's true. Any suggestions? We do a lot with cardboard, but I would like to give the kids more options. Storage is a problem also. Mm. Uh, so supplies, um, I ask for a lot. I, I, I ask my, um, my parents to bring in things, um, usually really low-cost items. But um, I, do you do like the apple? You No, you don't. Uh, Parent-teacher conferences and that kind of thing, I put little cute little apple stickers on my door, and it would say, we're looking for feathers or oh, sequins or buttons, a little wish list thing, and it's cute, and they take an apple, and they go to Walmart, and they fulfill your life dreams. Like a little um, Christmas angel tree. Yes. You've got a sick kid who needs something. You pull that off, you yes, go buy I've it. I've got and a classroom go. full of kids who need these things. Gotcha. Um, another way to... Um, to get materials is um, just to try to think about things that can be reused over time. So you might put in a little bit of investment. Um, one of the um, one of my favorite things in my toolbox right now is a, a package of um, plastic medicine syringes and some tubing. And it no can be needles. used right, just, just the syringe. little like the medicine ones okay. that are um, that you give your dog medicine with. <laughs> right. And um, they can be used for I, I've seen 10, 15 different groups use them for a variety of purposes. But it's a type of thing that's sturdy enough that when we're done, I can take that apart and put it back. So think of things that you can reuse multiple times mm -hmm. where I'm going to spend a little bit of money, but 
I know I'm going to get a good investment out of it. Mm -hmm. For storage, what I really like to do is try to um, purposely scale what we're doing. And I like copy paper boxes. So I hoard those copy paper boxes that are somewhere in your building. Um, and they're perfect. They're, they stack nicely. Okay, you'd have to see my desk to know that I'm very organized and clean. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> was that my classroom, it was not directed at anyone <laughs> well, at all. Good, good. Um, my classroom was that way too. So copy paper boxes, each group had one, all of the materials fit into it. And at the end of the day, we clean up the mess, we put it in our copy paper box and they stack very nicely in the side of the room. You can get, you know, four high or so and mm -hmm. they don't take up any space. It, it's clean and pretty. So that's my storage solution. That's a great story because a little name on it. Good yep. to go. I, for me and, um, Supply. I had a really great thought and idea. Now, just literally, like that second went away. For supplies, for real. I'm old. That's it. I had it. I had it right there. Um, no, don't turn it over don't here to me. Right. Nobody wants to see my thinking face. Because uh, you talked about sharing with parents. I like a Google Doc for mm -hmm. that, and they yeah. can sign in, sign up, and put their stuff on there. Uh, oh. Got it. Um, sometimes we, <laughs> it's not pretty what I think. Uh, it, uh, sometimes I uh, have the kids, well not sometimes, uh, I love it when they are building and constructing things, uh, but you're right, just dead on right, uh, Scott, that that gets really expensive. So what are challenges that you can give them where they can work electronically? So the things they're building a solution to, a, uh, a digital story of, or a something that isn't stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, they can still build things, or they can come up with a proposal for, or a, uh, you know, something that doesn't take stuff. Uh, create a, um, uh, a uh, an event uh, that, that brings awareness to. And by the way, the event doesn't have to be face-to-face -face and, and synchronous time. Uh, we can do it an online event that lasts a week or a month or a, you know, like a, like Red Ribbon Week or something like that. And you're creating a, a podcast series or you're creating a, a, a series of YouTube channel that will house, um, you know, those sorts of things that, that don't take stuff. So con consider that as well. Yeah? Right. Okay. If anybody had any other questions, type away super fast. <laughs> Hit your little microphone and talk into it if you need to. Because uh, we're, uh, we're thinking about wrapping up here. It's uh, actually been a 30 I minute. Know. This is a long one, but, you know, elementary teachers deserve to have a, a day of all, all, all for themselves, I think. Okay. Even though these really Venn diagrammed with secondary very nicely. First of all, I want to say thank you. I think we find that a lot when we talk. <laughs> well, I think that's PDL. I think that it can be flexible okay. around the way. Um, okay, so I want to say thank you so much uh, to Katie Perez for thank being you. here. Thanks for having uh, me. She, uh, she, she does come out to schools and works with teachers and, and helping elementary teachers figure out how to make this happen. In fact, you work like over time to really coach and go deep yes, with them. It's my favorite. It's not just a ta-da and be done. So yeah, Let's have some ongoing support and uh, learn what PBL is and then watch it happen in your classroom and then make it happen in your classroom. Well, and then reflect what went right, what went wrong, and, yes. and yeah, absolutely. And actually, I saw Emmy came in, and uh, you're going to be going to Emmy School before too long. Friday morning. See Yay. you then, Emmy. <laughs> this, like this week? Yeah. Oh, my gosh. That's <laughs> awesome. So, hey, guys, uh, as we are for sure wrapping this up, I just want to say, uh, if you haven't yet liked the Life Practice PBL page, which was probably where you're seeing this, if you're watching it live, uh, you may be looking at it later. But Life Practice, it's a Facebook dot com slash life practice pbl and go in there like that page share it with a colleague and a friend who might need a little extra love and support in the active hands-on learning sphere and uh, just want to let you know that our next facebook live chat is all about pbl and the realities of time and scheduling we hinted about that a little bit ago uh, there are times where teachers uh, at the elementary level say but I don't have time by the way Katie's going to be in on that too because we're talking <laughs> specifically some elementary but at the secondary level there's real challenge with um, kids going to different classrooms in different times so uh, we'll talk about some possible <clears throat> possible solutions that might work for you and, and see if you guys have any thoughts to share too Emmy says I'm excited to see you Friday Yay. 
And uh, so I just want to say thanks so much for being here, whether you're watching it live or later. And if there's anything that you thought was valuable here, be sure to share that with colleagues. Can you reach over there and grab I that can. for me? I know you've got short arms and all, but um, I, get up. I wanted to, well, I'm tired of sitting for 30 minutes. Oh, it's backward. Someday. Somebody want to reprint this thing where it's not backward. This is our Lessons for Life Practice hour, meaning me in my pocket. But yeah. yeah. Lessons for Life Practice Learning uh, PBL book. Uh, always a lot of great, well, I'll just go ahead and pat myself on the back. The questions that teachers ask me, a lot of them ended up in here. Uh, how to put together a project and each piece of the project what do we need to do to make sure it's successful? So if that's uh, interesting to you, uh, you can grab that uh, Kindle version on Amazon or you can buy the paperback on Amazon too, but it's more expensive there. If you want the less expensive, that's on the ESDAC shop and I'll drop that into this chat conversation as well. I'm run out of words. It's the end of the day. <laughs> so thanks so much for being here, everyone, and uh, post those questions and we'll see you the t October 26th. Oh, hold I think. on. I've got it here. Let me just look real quick. October 27th or 28th. There's a schedule there at the top of the page, right? October 27th. That's what you said, isn't it? It is. You rock. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> oh, Scott, time's difficult. So is getting kids out of the groove of consuming info. It is. And, and it, things are difficult. Things, A lot of things worth doing are difficult. That doesn't mean we don't do it. You know, don't we ask our kids to, to work through things that are difficult because it's better for us. So we'll see you October 27th, and uh, go ahead and post questions anytime up to that point. We'll field those. Thanks, guys. Bye.